Hi, my name is Chad Bergman, and I'm a designer advocate here at Figma. Welcome to the Hidden Layers of Design Systems, where we go beyond the components to have deeper conversations around the underlying side of building, supporting, and evolving design systems. Today we're joined by Jenny Yip, who works on the Atlassian Design System. Thank you for being here today, Jenny. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing fantastic, thank you. So before we jump right in, I'm curious, you know, could you share a little bit more about what it is that you do at Atlassian? Oh yeah, I've been at Atlassian as um, the lead designer for Atlassian Design System for the past five years. And so we've been actually reimagining Atlassian Design System, moving it from product to platform, setting a vision and a strategy and making that come to life. Awesome. Well, and so much with doing vision and strategy, yeah, we think about that being those hidden layers of the design system, right? Where we want to go beyond the components and think about the governance side of things. And I know, especially when you're playing out that vision side, there's a lot of thought that has to go into what do we want to do? What trade-offs should be made? What are guiding principles? Um, I almost want to start by going backwards though. So when you first started at Atlassian, it was still the Atlassian Design Guidelines, mm -hmm. and it was transitioning over to Atlassian Design System. Can you maybe share a little bit more about what led to the centralization of the design system with that shift? Yeah, so the design system is actually almost 13 years old now, and so it was an interesting shift from all the evolution of it because every single generation was different and we didn't have a team until 2018 when it was the third generation. And so every year was like launching, launching and everything was coming in for governance. So not a lot of governance, everything just comes in. And so as you can imagine, as it grows and grows and grows, it bloats. And so really when I got there, I felt like you had to really understand the whole context and be like a historian for a little bit to understand what how we got here. Um, and then we really kind of set and went on our journey to kind of like, let's kind of establish what we think we should go as a team. So we started by building um, values and principles to kind of like align the team in the central direction. And then uh, we kind of just started to work towards bringing all the different sources of truth together. So we actually had ADG, Atlassian Design Guidelines, a site. And then we had Atlas Kit, which is like the React component library, was yeah. another website. So we have two entities really being driven by two different teams, design and eng, how do we bring them together, right? So there's a lot of culture building, kind of operation stuff behind the scenes to really bring that uh, entity together. So uh, one of the first projects I worked on was really redesigning the site and bringing it to that central source of truth. And we did a huge content migration. Uh, and then we basically were able, that's, that was like our big key moment to say, we are becoming a design system. So that was when we transitioned from Atlassian Design Guidelines to Atlassian Design System. And you said you know, in the beginning that everything is coming into it and figuring out what all goes into it. You know, multiple teams are doing different things or maybe they're utilizing uh, pieces of Atlas Kit on the development side. Maybe they're using some of the design resources. But thinking about bringing it together and really becoming that design system side of it, you know, how has that helped with the growth and adoption of the system across all of Atlassian? Mm -hmm. So if you think about it before, we didn't really have strong boundaries. So once we start to decide, hey, we need to say, this is in the system, this is not in the system, why, why, why not? Then we can start to govern it a little bit more. And so for adoption, you're like really pushing, like figuring out who should adopt which parts and who should we move like the parts to different teams for ownership, for example. So everything becomes more clear. Everyone has more accountability. Ability. Um, and so, you know, as we've cleaned things up, we've also kind of, uh, that's why we call it reimagine. We kind of restructured everything and put everything back together. Yeah. And so now everything is easier to use. It's more modular, it's more flexible, it's meeting everybody where uh, all the adoption is needed. Uh, so that's how it's kind of like been, like when you start to understand what, and build what they need, then they start to be like, hey, like, you know, my maker productivity is increasing, getting better and faster. And so, uh, we've been slowly just kind of rebuilding the culture within Atlassian to really adopt ADS and like just understand why we are doing that, you know? So everybody's kind of upskilling in design systems, systems thinking, understanding how to build UI a little bit better and compose things together and also build their own local systems. Awesome. 
So as people are really up-leveling and starting to think more from a systems thinking perspective, uh, there's one thing that we often hear questions around, what about contributions, right? Like contributions, they can be a great way to help grow a system, it can get people engaged, but it can also come with confusion, and sometimes it comes with both, it's growth and confusion. Mm -hmm. And you know, some teams, like Atlassian, uh, actually don't accept contributions to the system. And can you share maybe why you have historically not accepted contributions into the Atlassian design system? Yeah, so that was actually a very kind of strong point of view we had to take. So in order to clean up the system and the boundaries and what's in it and out of it, we had, and move everything to the right places, we need to kind of pick a spot to kind of pause and we pause contributions so it's like phase one and we're just saying actually we will just take in small ones which is like you know bug fixes documentation fixes and stuff like that but to shepherd a whole big contribution in the system there's actually spends a lot more time and effort and money in the end to uh, do that rather than attempting it from the systems team so we kind of take a different approach now where it's like contribution isn't really taken just like everything comes in it's more like let's figure out what's the right like pattern to work on and then let's actually leverage what's been happening around the org to bring all those different thoughts together and then kind of do a whole audit again of like this is what tables should look like for example now yeah this is how we should evolve it and these are the features and and you know like over time all the feature teams and local teams have been building all these instances of like table for example and now it's our team's job to kind of shepherd and kind of uh guide all those different features together to see what makes the most sense for all because we have 18 plus products right so we have to figure out what is the universal table component for example so it's like now we're on that journey to like let's really evolve that and now it's you already have all the different co-creators with you yeah. so it gets them kind of bought in and they're really invested in making this new component a success and so that's another way to kind of like um, bring in adoption like more org organically and with adapting across all the different products, you know, how would you recommend that design system teams stay in tune with consumers of the system? Uh, that way they know how to support new use cases. We built a lot of different relationships with the teams through the features we've been uh, launching. So for example, design tokens, dark mode, all the stuff that we've been kind of integrating uh, and testing out. And even the different foundations now, like we've been testing out shape and spacing tokens, semantic ones, and stuff like that. So we have always have a little uh, pilot with uh, specific uh, teams that are interested in using those things. And so uh, we've built that relationship slowly over time. They're eager to like help us test it out and adopt it. And so that's our way of like kind of getting our foot in to see what's happening across the org. And we also have another initiative called uh, Design Pattern Library, which is kind of like a group that's kind of overseeing all the different uh, emerging patterns and global patterns are kind of popping up everywhere and we're trying to collect it all the different patterns that are kind of like uh, surfacing through local systems putting them into a central uh, place for people to find so the makers can actually be like oh like this pattern is showing up here and this pattern because you know organically otherwise in such a big org we have 500 designers they're all going to start designing the same thing so how do we kind of surface emerging things in a central source of truth for visibility, discoverability, and some of that is even a Figma, like enterprise work, workspace related. We have to like organize the IA and name all the systems correctly and all that kind of stuff. So we're starting to lay the foundations for that kind of governance right now. Product teams have the resources available. They can find it and self-serve. Maybe thinking of teams that maybe aren't aware of the system or maybe they feel that they have use cases that they, you know, we'll say can't use the system because of those unique use cases. Mm -hmm. you know, are there ways that you found success in influencing or persuading those teams mm -hmm. to leverage the system? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of examples I can think of. It's like one, our design system right now is only for product. And we're actually working very closely with the web, like website, web properties teams, like external to product to kind of expand the surface coverage. And so what we mean is like, since we're saying we want one design system for all now, we're kind of saying, hey, where are the different kind of like gaps across the different design languages? Because there's like a marketing design language, a product design language, how do we meet them in the middle? And like we've identified convergence points, which is like 
in the foundation, where can we like expand some of the parts so we can give them that base to build upon, right? So for example, we also have acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've acquired Trello a long time ago. And for example, back then our color palette didn't have like a magenta or a teal palette. And so we basically work with those teams to kind of evolve the foundations and say, hey, let's very uh, strategically and have a strong point of view around like which ones should come in. Uh, and then we actually grow and evolve the system together to change the foundations and change the system. So a lot of it comes into the relationship side mm -hmm. as the system grows. Uh, you mentioned the culture side of things. So how do you continue to build upon those relationships and shape the culture around the design system? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because when you're a design system team, your users and the people that you're piloting with are all internal to you. So it's great to try and cultivate cultures through like events that are like just not even like related to design system piloting things, but just like go in the office and like meet and stuff like that. Um, but really like building relationships and just continuing to build that trust is like super important because like we have, uh, you know, systems thinker, like systems teams is like we're working on things that are much slower to deliver. And then feature teams, product teams are working on things that are much faster to deliver. They need it for like a big event or like a, you know, like a, a conferences, yeah. stuff like that. So how do we balance, you know, the kind of meet, needs and wants and also like keep that trust between us because everybody has different needs. And so we have to kind of think of ways to strategically roll out change together. So it's like there's a fast track, there's a slow track. Uh, maybe the fast track is working a little bit faster. Maybe we implement rollout a little bit different and then just take the learnings from there and then move it into the slow track to like uh, integrate it into the bigger foundational system. Kind of our last question, just in general for folks who are finding themselves uh, working on design systems and really building that community and the relationships there. Any one grand piece of advice that you would offer for folks? Maybe just take everything one thing at a time. You know, it can get really overwhelming when you're just like, we got to build the system, we got to do all these things, we got to evolve everything. There's so many problems that, like, everybody's kind of working on the same thing and all the different systems. And so the, the trick is really to just figure out what you need, what your team needs, and just build and start from there day by day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. It was great chatting with you today. Yeah, thank you so much, too. All right.